But our shenanigans are cheeky and fun. Yeah, I mean, his shenanigans are cruel and tragic. Which makes them not shenanigans at all, really. Evil shenanigans. I swear to God, I'll pistol whip the next guy that says shenanigans. Welcome on back to the Rebel Shenanigans Podcast. Mike, in a hundred words or less, please explain to the audience how much you have missed me over the past week and a half. Go. None. It's not very nice. It was under a hundred, so I mean, yeah, it's kind of nice. I filled the criteria. I mean, so we're just going to ignore the many text messages you send me in the middle of the night, the, 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 the pictures you send me. Uh, the emails reaching out constantly, you constantly pirating my my wife's phone number, trying to call mm-hmm. me. Um, I, all I of have these a things are that true. kind of flashes the lights of trying to send an SOS to you, see how you're doing, but you never respond to the ships in the lake, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. Eh, well, you know, I, 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 I appreciate you being a little coy for the audience, but they know the truth, they know that this is a love affair that has lasted 485 episodes. Um, but we are we are back. Welcome on uh, to the show. We're trying to get back in the rhythm of being a little bit more steady here. The summer kind of chopped things up for us. And, you know, having, a, having another baby kind of really chopped up the schedule a little bit. But we are we're rocking and rolling here. We're, we're, we're more on the regular. Uh, Mike, um, one of our... Um, esteemed faces in, in, in the celebrity world. Um, someone that everyone held in high regard um, has been taken down. Um, his reputation... It's not Yi again, is it? No, it's not Kanye West. Um, his reputation is um, it's on the mend, if you will. But Yeah, but it's Yi for me. Yeah, we know. You call him Yi. We call him... Yeah. But... Um, <laughs> Uh, the one and only Dave Grohl taking a hit, um, <laughs> taking a hit in the world. I don't know Ooh. if you saw this, Mike. Dave Grohl seemed to be like everybody's cool dad. Like everyone seemed to kind of like one of those guys who could do no wrong. I feel like there's a few of them out there in the in the in the public eye um, that you're like, I don't know, this guy's just awesome. Like like Danny DeVito. Nobody hates Danny DeVito, right? Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of some other ones. But the all around kind of Betty cool. White when she was around. Betty White, exactly. Seemed to do no wrong. Dave Grohl seemed to be like kind of the rock version of that, you know, like the guy has all of the Nirvana catalog, all the Foo Fighters catalog. He's kind of fun. He pokes fun at himself. He's always done. But just uh, Dave Grohl coming out out of nowhere saying, Yeah, I am looking for support from my family. I had a kid out of wedlock basically a kid in another relationship so your reaction to this uh i was surprised by it i'm not i wouldn't say like no this there's a zero percent chance i was true when i heard the news but it was a little disheartening to kind of hear that basically yeah the rock and roll daddy of all of us who we all counted on who's Basically been on the streets for about, what, now, since the nice about 30-odd years. Mm-hmm. He'd say, nah, he, he's a good guy. He goes back to his bus. He calls his family, tells them he loves him. He does a guest spot on the television show. Mm-hmm. And the whole world loves him and all. But, it- uh, yeah, he has desires. <laughs> now, here's my one of my initial reactions. Why... Why come out and post that? Like, I, like, is this him trying to get ahead of it? Is this him knowing he's in the doghouse and his uh, his wife is like, oh, you're gonna post it out to the world, everyone's gonna see who you are? Or is this um, almost like a blackmail scenario? Him trying to get ahead, like people know it, and the news is coming out, and, and he's trying to do some damage control. I gotta think it was. Something was going to come out, and it's not just something was going to come out. Somebody has to have, like, a video or something like that, because anytime, like, those rumors start, you can easily go, I don't know what you're talking about, or this person's just, like, 
one of the crew members, uh, blah, 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 this and that. But there had to have been enough where it's like, all right, it's going to get out there and I'm going to look bad immediately. So I might as well be the apologetic. I'm yeah. so sorry. Someone, Let someone, someone else knows something for you to come mm-hmm. out and just be like, Hey guys, I had this kid. Like nobody really ever had to find out about this. If it was truly like an understanding situation, uh, somebody knows something. Um, it doesn't just, and now this guy, he's like begging for his, you know, to, for his privacy and whatnot. Ironically, you put it out there <laughs> in the world that you had a kid, you need, you're going to know the reaction is going to be like, okay, here comes 3000 memes and every song title they worked into. Um, I think I saw someone type, there goes my hero, like 500 times. Um, I got another confession to make. I saw about 20 times posted. Yeah. He's, he's in the doghouse. He's in the doghouse. That's for sure. I wonder if there was ever a celebrity that says, hey, we need a little privacy, and it actually worked. <laughs> yeah. Like all the paparazzi were like, oh, okay, if you ask it, and all, <laughs> they just walk away from your home and all. Just let us know when we can uh, chat with you again. They're say just, three months. They're just talking to each other like, whoa, 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 put that camera down. This guy asked for privacy. Ah, <laughs> what are you doing? The what? sacred law says you put it down. <laughs> what, like, what if that was the the secret to just let, having the paparazzi leave you leave you alone and no one really figured that out until a couple guys. You figured out the paparazzi code. <laughs> My God. All these signs were showing up to the airports and everybody was trying to punch us. Mm-hmm. If you only said you wanted privacy. Yeah. Yeah. I um a little curious about like the coming out public part uh, uh, of that whole scenario. I'm just wondering like what this guy's life looks like now. Like, like, and who is left as far like he's just okay now. He's just another rock star sleeping around like with other women, banging out babies left and right. Um He's ever he's just like all the other ones. He now I feel like he he takes a hit and you know he's back to you're just lumped in with all the other rock guys. Yeah, um, like who is left at sacred? Um, I don't know. Bon Jovi would did he have any stuff? I don't know. Meanwhile, Bon Jovi's having a killer way. He's saving people from jumping off bridges, and um, mm. I I mean. Bon Jovi definitely uh, I seem to have won the music week. Yeah, yeah. So maybe Bon Jovi, maybe Weird Al Yankovic. That's about the... <laughs> like, if he comes out, he's like, yeah, I had premarital sex, and then the world is just messed up. And it's, <laughs> then we give up in life. Yeah, he could come out and say, I've had babies with 30 different women, and no one would bat- would care whatsoever if you're Weird Al. But if you're Dave Grohl, like everybody's little, you know, rock grandpa or rock daddy like eh, it hurts i'm curious how his like does he come right back out and is his first reaction to write a song about this to try to butter up the the fans like an apology song or what a piece of crap he is like is that his goal like is that his game plan next i mean maybe a music video where like he he's doing the act and then like halfway through the song as the melody's going his head is down knowing that he caused pain to his lovely wife and uh you know they have a scene where an actress is scolding him and he's feeling down but in the end of the song they get back together because that's what life is like a music video we can solve it in three minutes (laughs) yeah i think i think he's i think particularly it, it hurts for him because he did have like the I'm a funny guy personality. Like, uh, I love my family. I'm pretty cool. Like, I'm funny. Now, I feel like he's going to have to take this serious tone next time he is in the public and and, and kind of figure that out. Or he gets ahead of it and just, like, (laughs) pushes his wife (laughs) to the curb and is like, I didn't like her anymore. She was awful. And shifts it onto her. I'm pure rock and roll now. Yeah. You can't settle me down. I'm having yeah. babies left and right around the world. <laughs> it's interesting because, like, he, I'm curious with his daughters too. He, he like brings his one daughter all the time up on stage to sing with them. I'm curious the dynamic that happens with Dave Grohl coming up. It'd be great if like he did that announcement, but he was still on tour. It's like, come on, honey, come on. <laughs> We got to sing the song. It's the Mentos song. Remember that one? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so that, was, that was a little bit of an interesting story. It's just not that I'm surprised because, listen, 
they're rock stars and they have millions of dollars and lured by everyone and anyone. I'm I'm more curious how this plays out for him as far well, as his personality in the public. Well, one thing I was listening to the radio when this came out and uh, somebody brought up an old article where um, Courtney Love claimed that he hit on her 19-year-old daughter, as in her and Ooh, Kurt's daughter. Okay, okay. So when something like that comes uh, comes back into uh, reality, then you're starting to go into the, ooh, was he creepy all along? But then becomes the other thing. Like, do we ever see Courtney Love as a reliable resource for anything? Like, she's <laughs> a train wreck pretty much all the time. So finally, <laughs> if we only listened to Courtney Love this entire time, we would know the truth. Well, you know what they say, all these like conspiracy guys, right? They're crazy, like these Alex Joneses. But every once in a while, they hit one that's that's true. And everyone's like, well, see, there's a uh, he, he was right about this. Yeah. And it reminds me back to when we were uh, early on and we were popping uh, tweets out when it was still Twitter. Uh-huh. And uh, was it Chris Novoselic? I we said in a tweet, oh, I used to be a fan of Nirvana. And he replied, so you no longer it. And we could yeah. never get him to reply back again. Maybe no. we can be like, oh, so sorry for Dave. Side note, you remember us from six years ago? <laughs> you want to come on? And, and for people in the music world, Mike was trying to say Chris Novoselic. Uh, Chris Novoselic oh, yeah. is probably a businessman out in the Wisconsin <laughs> area, but you know. Um. Yeah, we couldn't get him either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, we're struggling for guest people. That's why we're taking two weeks off every time. <laughs> nah, we got some stuff coming. We got some stuff. We got a, we got a returning guest today, which will, I know, kind of fits into this rock world too, but we, we can't get to him just yet. Um, what what else we we had it? I feel like the last time we podcasted, or or maybe even just two episodes ago, the president was almost assassinated, and we were talking about that. And then turns out he was almost assassinated again. Like, is this the the new? I I feel like this one didn't even get the coverage. Like, it's already old old news compared to the first one. Yeah, let's go with starters <laughs> and all. He, you know, he went with the Elmer Fudd kind of deal. Like he was in the bushes with a, a pistol sticking out, and he really thought he was going to get Bugs Bunny there for a I'm minute. I'm going to get him. <laughs> Be very, very quiet. I'm hunting twumps. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I'm kind of curious, like how he actually got away from the Secret Service, because for what I heard, like they see his his gun sticking out of the bushes. <laughs> So they start shooting at him, and but yet somehow he still was able to leave the bushes, not get hit, get in the car, and take off for a little bit where the, the police had to catch him. Yeah, the, the whole story seems a little strange to me. Like, And, and this is how crazy I, I, I think the world is at the moment. Like, I didn't see... Um, I didn't hear people talking about it yesterday or today, like that I that I talked to. Nobody mentioned it. Like, are we is this the new normal? Like every week, like we're gonna be like, oh yeah, Trump dodged another one, like eh, yeah. still can't get hit, you know. Like it sounds like a dark comedy sitcom where like every week somebody tries to uh, assassinate a former president and all <laughs> like all right, you guys gotta set the bar lower, like me. Jimmy Carter might be easier to hit <laughs> right now. And know, like if if you want to go practice. Now, now even um now now if, if you're the the biggest conspiracy theorist, maybe, maybe they're saying that Trump scheduled this after his lovely debate performance, may and he needed people back on his side again. Yeah. Um, he, he's like, listen, um I went a little deep with the the <laughs> The, ant, the pet eating, uh, I, re- I really need some positive stuff right here. Yeah, like can, can we get another professional to <laughs> the other ear? So like it's almost like an earring thing, and like we can get a trend going. <laughs> so like, Mr. President, I don't think you could do the stand up and fight thing again. Like the odds of that <laughs> being believable are pretty pretty rough. Maybe we'll <laughs> go with shooter in the woods approach uh, <laughs> this time. Um, yeah, he. Uh, the debate, I, I, I tuned in, um, and I, I was saying to myself, I'm like, you know, all all Trump had to do for his supporters or his side was just, like, 
stay calm, just answer the questions. Like he didn't have to do anything really. Mm -hmm. Like um, he didn't have to get crazy. If he just stayed calm, I feel like I would be like, yeah, Trump dog did it. You know, he, uh, yeah, he, he, he killed the debate. He's fine. We support him. Like, <laughs> if there's anyone actually in the middle, like undecided, I don't, <laughs> I don't think this was his uh, best performance. You can see it just his demeanor starting to change. And, and it was like, as soon as she mentioned his rallies, like his head exploded and he just couldn't handle the idea that someone was insulting his beloved rallies. And then it was just off the rails from there. Yeah, he you could literally see two <laughs> seconds after she said they leaving board like his <laughs> he blanked and his eyes went up like he's literally looking at his brain like. All right, it's it's go time, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> and like everybody in the back is like, "Oh God, no!" <laughs> yeah, and you know, like he's a guy that like he probably like he probably has handlers and and strategists and things like that, and they probably do try to you know talk to him before and prep him before, and you know he's just like. Like it's just in one year and I was like, yeah, yeah, got it, got it, got it. Good, good. Yep, this is the plan. And then you can, you know, they're all in the back going, oh no, oh no, here it comes, here it comes. Uh, did you notice he's he, president? He, he started something's going on with his hair. He's almost, it's almost looking somewhat normal compared to what it used to. And he's not as orange as he used to be. Yeah, I'm thinking he's getting a little tired in his age. To be honest with you, I, I feel like. Like, cause he's not even doing that many rallies anymore. You don't, most of the commercials are not ending with uh, I'm Donald J. Trump and I approve this message. So I think he's kind of going the tame. Right? I think he went into it. Just I, nobody's convinced him like Biden is out because he literally, I think he's going in there like cakewalk. I got this. Mm -hmm. And now that there's like an actual competition, it's kind of like a baseball team going into the playoffs. It's like, yep. I got the seventh seed. There's no issues, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, snap, they found their pitching. I don't know what to do. Yeah. Um, he, he, uh, he's definitely, he's definitely losing his mind um, as if he it wasn't lost already, but he's, um, he's definitely getting older and he's get he's not as sharp as he, and he's, he's not as like, I feel like his comebacks aren't as uh, crushing as they used to be to the opponent, you know? Yeah. Like when I was in the car talking to the wife, I, and I said, "Oh, he calls her laughing comma," and she even's like, "And that's not that's not a good nickname. That's not like a like all the ones before and all were just like hammer it down." The crooked Hillary took off the sleeping Joe. Uh, what, what was the one he gave Christy? I forget. I don't, I don't know. know. Big, but, that but, asshole Christy would be a good, <laughs> bro, good but, but, but like it, he used to be zingers and all. Get, get to the baseball term. He was that like 99 mile an hour fastball starter that could go eight innings. Now he's like throwing a curveball, got a little yeah. change up, and he's he, going like five innings and giving he's, up yeah, runs. He's struggling not to get out of the fifth to get the uh, comp the game to, to register as a win. You know, he's mm -hmm. got to get the whole game. Yeah, uh, there's something off his fastball for sure. Um, as far as Kamala, like, not a big fan of her, but I thought she handled herself pretty well. Like, this is the first time I ever, like, actually saw her, like, speak kind of normal and, like, kind of calm and quiet. And, you know, doing the old presidential shtick, like, I'll fight for you. But, like, some people, that's all they need. That's all they want. It's just, like, someone who seems <laughs> sane, you know, like, who, who doesn't seem insane. And I think, you know, the thing on her was, like, oh, yeah, she's crazy. She's insane. She cackles. And I thought she handled herself pretty well, being someone who it, it is in the middle and really doesn't have a, a, a dog in the race. So um, I definitely think she, she won that one. Yeah. She went into it like, uh, like two brothers, like the mother's like, if you, any of you start a fight, you're, you're getting grounded for a week. And she's like the, the son, like as they're getting into the car, pokes the other one gets in and just sits back as the other one's like slapping them and it's going to lose his Xbox for two weeks. Yeah, yeah, not a pretty performance from. But the other thing is, like, he he won't lose any supporters. They all think he no. he crushed it and that um, she was horrible. It's like, listen, like, 
all he had to do was what he whatever that that last Biden debate was, where he just kind of stayed calm and let Biden fall down a hole. He took the bait on everything in this one, like everything. He was like, oh, I'm going, you know, how dare you? And he's talking about eating dog. He's saying Biden hates her. He's, he was going crazy towards the end. Yeah. And we only had a third option, but the third option is um, apparently getting investigated for cutting off a whale's head and taking it through three uh, states. Did you hear about that one? R- RFK cut off some whale heads? Yeah. Nice. Yeah, apparently he went, <laughs> like he's, they say he's fascinated with like animals and skulls. Mm-hmm. And he was in some state where I guess it was like a beach whale. I assume it can't be that insanely large, but apparently like he cut off its head. Like it, one of his children are saying this. And he strapped it to the top of the roof of the car and he drove it back to the house, which was like three states away. And she said, like, you know, the fluids from the whale were like flying off and hitting other cars. Oh, my God. They're going back. This is this is makes me a full supporter. Uh, (laughs) This is the coolest story ever. If Big Wild Hank, like your dad came on the show and like, let me tell you about the time. Hank cut a whale's head off and horrified Michael in the back seat. I was like, this is the best dad of all time. Let's vote for this guy. But maybe uh, Scott, as the episode came out, I, I'm getting the reports. The polls are up. <laughs> He's up 82% right now. <laughs> was the whale dead or was the whale alive? It's going by the same story. Like, you know, the other one where he apparently found like a dead cub and he couldn't use it. So he like dumped it in uh city the park in um in new york city huh. or something like that um it's kind of the same thing where it's like oh the whale was dead so i just i was interested so i cut off the head and brought it home no i'm not gonna sit there and say i'm siding with him in one minute but if the whale <laughs> is dead eh, you're just throwing a whale head on like what what uh, all right here's my question if the whale was dead and Mr. Mr. Kennedy didn't touch. What happens with that? Someone else probably comes and scoops him up and grinds him up and cuts him. I don't think they do like, uh, what do they do with that? Well, I don't know. I guess it goes to like uh, an aquarium for like, um, just to see how it died. I don't, I don't know. The, I, I didn't research. I don't, I don't think aquariums are doing like CSI whale edition which well that's going to be the next season on cbs right right there i mean that's all (laughs) they've run out of options they've done las vegas miami now it's aquarium (laughs) (laughs) Aquarium. (laughs) maybe he won't maybe wanted to study the whale head or or mount it or something i mean what are you gonna do you know some yeah. some presidential candidates have sex with porn stars and go bankrupt. Some don't know where they are. Some cut off a whale head. It's really not the end of the whale world, I don't think. Yeah, I guess you got to fill out paperwork for that whale head. Maybe that's their big concern, you know. No, no. Nobody... Is it because of is it because of the size of the animal? Because you you know, if it was a raccoon, no one would care about the raccoon head. I guess it's it, <laughs> since whales are endangered for the most part, I would assume that's the main reason behind it. Cause nobody's, I haven't, I mean, technically to say it was illegal what he did picking up the dead <laughs> bear and dumping it in the middle of the park, but yeah, <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't know, but yeah, we're, we're doomed. But anyway, um, let's uh, be, before we're doomed, before we get to the November election, which at this rate, might be our next episode. Um, no, just kidding. We'll be back. But uh, let's bring on a guy that segues perfectly from Whalehead story. Um, <laughs> yeah. Now, if we Who were pl- if we produced the show, we would talk about like the rock star stuff leading into the rock star that we have on the show. But you know, mm. we had to go Whalehead first and kind of divert back. But uh, Mike, we have a a new two timer to the show here, so. Um, you may know their their famous song "Shine" amongst a whole, whole bunch of others. They've been doing it for uh, three decades. Um, they came up when you know I really got into music in the '90s and, and whatnot. They played both Woodstocks um, years ago. We had Dean Rowland, guitarist from Collective Soul, on the show, and today, uh, a couple of years later, we're circling back with him. They are out on tour with uh, Hootie and the Blowfish right now. So here we go again. Here is Dean Rowland of Collective Soul. Hey, Mike. 
What's going on, Dean? Going on, man. We are uh, out here on the road, laser shows, doing our thing. Yeah, and I'm not sure if you remember, but uh, we had you on a couple years back on the show, um, so we're glad to have you back on. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's great to see you guys still killing it out there. You're um, currently out on tour with Hootie and the Blowfish, correct? Yeah, we're doing, uh, we do like three shows a week with Hootie and uh, and Evelyn McCain, and then we mix in our own headlining shows along with those. So it's, it's been a lot of fun. It's been a good summer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so what's the current state of Collective Soul? Are we focusing on new music right now? Is it just focusing on playing out live, the tour, new music in the works? What's uh, just, what's going on? With yeah, uh, we released uh, a new record. It's called Here to Eternity. It came out in, uh, I think, May of this year. Yeah, it just came out, yeah, it came out just a, a couple of months ago. We recorded, uh, recorded it last year at Palm Springs at Elvis Presley's Yet in a State. There in Palm Springs, um, Julio Graceland, and then this was his other house that he had. And we knew the people that, that owned the house, and it really hadn't been changed since Elvis was living there. And um, we asked him if we could move our studios here and there and just go to work. And they, they were open to it, and we did it. Made a made a double album in there. Was it like readily accessorized already, or are you using stuff from like the seventies making this album? What was going on in the house? No, the, not a whole lot. They had it like uh, they really hadn't kept up with it that much. To be honest, I mean, it still had like the same kitchen appliances. The bathrooms were the same, so it was all like seventies. Seventies. He wasn't on the toilet, right? Out. No, no, no. He wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> no, that would have been uh, that would have been awkward. So, what do you think is the secret to Collective Soul's longevity? You guys are still, you have a lot of tour dates going on. You're still pushing out albums, uh, and you guys have been going on for multiple decades now, uh, nearly forty years, which is hard to believe. What is the secret for you guys? I mean, I think it it just. It has a couple of things. I mean, the, the fact that we share the the passion of you know of writing music and playing music and that thing, and then the other is like you know I'm in a band with my brother and Will, our bass player. We grew up together, so it's like Jesse's from Georgia, and you know, so we just came up in this you know very like minded world. Um, and it's just rooted in that stuff. So. I, it, there's so much of it, you know. You get on stage and you play an hour, a couple hours a night. But then there's the rest of the time. You got to be with people that you know you get along with, and you know that you can trust, and you know you have your own little support system now here in this circus. What we do, so those are probably the key components. Um, but you know, we knew or we first started that we were given an opportunity and we wanted to make the most of it. We, you know, we took it pretty serious. I mean, we were knuckleheads and did stupid stuff, you know, rock and roll, dumb stuff. You got to do a little bit of that, but for the most part, we played, we, we kept it in the road and, and, and wanting to take advantage of the opportunity given to us. I'm oh, no, curiosity for what I understand you and your brother was like 10 years apart in age. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. So, like, what was the relationship growing up? Did you always two have a bond, or was that no. that kind of? Yeah, it was too much I, of an I'm age difference. Doing high school stuff. Yeah, it was that. But I, I kind of watched, um, what he listened to music wise. I mean, I mean, guys, like when I was six years old, he was in high school. You know, he was when I was eight, he was leaving high school. He went to Berkeley and been Boston for school of music and so like we didn't really see each other. I mean we didn't really become like friends until I was in high school and that's when we just started hanging out and and he didn't even know I played guitar but he, he had been doing different bands and he came home one afternoon and I was just in my room playing he's like I I didn't even know you played he's like yeah he goes you want to play together I'm like yeah sure we went. We just started playing shows and just went from there. And then got a record contract and off she, you know, off we went. 
when you guys first came up, you kind of got lumped into the grunge sound a little bit. Um, you were played together with a lot of grunge bands, and I never found Collective Soul to be exactly like the grunge bands at the time. Did you ever have pressure from labels or or management to make grungier type of music? We no, nah, we we always we just consider ourselves a rock band. We try to find honest lyrics and some uh, some good melodies, and a lot a lot of times that comes with the guitar riffs heavier guitar, sometimes it's pianos or, you know, orchestral strings. Uh, so we never saw ourselves in that world at all. Um, uh, we got criticized because we were getting lumped in and they were, you know, like the critics would say that we were grunge light or we were wimpy or whatever the fuck they would say. And it's like, whatever. I mean, you just, we're just doing what we do. You can, you can take it or leave it. So that's, that's kind of been our attitude about it. We never really chased any, any, genre or uh, trend out there we just really stayed true to what we felt like we wanted to do and challenge ourselves creatively and when you guys did uh, the first album like it was almost a shock it was like it's like yup you're hot go out there and you're kind of like touring not even like mm-hmm. really knowing each other I- i'm kind of curious about like e- what I heard in an interview once where you're saying you were guys were basically writing the second album and trying it out on stage as you were touring. I'm kind of curious, right. you know, were there ever nights where you recall anything or it's like, yeah, those are the lyrics. This is what's going to make us. Or was there ever a night where you turn your burn and like, yeah, don't use those. They ain't fitting at all tonight. Well, we used, so that first record, the one with Sean, it was a, uh, it was really a, a batch of demos. I mean, there were some band songs on there, but a lot of it was just stuff that Ed had made by himself for, to, to, to get a publishing deal or get, really get anything. We were just kind of seeing what happened, and it, and it got picked up by a college radio station where I was going to school. I, I, I dropped it off there, and they started playing it, and that got us some traction, and then it went to independently, it went to mainstream radio, and that's when we got signed. So that record was never really in our minds, it was never intended to be the band first record. We, you know, we wanted, we thought we'd get a deal, go in, you know, have songs ready and make, you know, make essentially what became the, the second record, blue record with World I Know in December. Um, so what we did was we were on the road that first, that 94 year, anytime, any, any of our off days that we weren't playing shows, we would find a studio and record, you know, in, in any one of the places and, and, ba- and yeah, basically the the pre-production rehearsals were, were we were doing that on stage, and Ed, it would a lot of times would be Ed not having lyrics at all, and he would just be up there like mumbling stuff. <laughs> but it's like, you kind of you can't really tell if no one's heard. It. It's like uh, you're just kind of like just working through it, and you you, you hear a, a lyric that kind of pops out, and you're like, oh okay, I'll hang on with that one. So. Oh, that's what we're doing. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So it just kind of took its own shape. Um, yeah. So we we knew that we had, we wanted to get a record out as soon as possible. So we released a, a record. Uh, so you heard right it here that. first. Collective Soul invented mumble rap. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, we've gone back to this bootleg to the, a lot of those live shows, and I'm listening back to it, and it's it's kind of hilarious because he he really is saying a whole bunch of nothing. <laughs> so leading up to the interview i kind of did a deep dive um and watched both of your your woodstock sets um, both in 94 and, and 99 and you know one of them you were able to play during the day and the other one you were play at nighttime um and i was just wondering curious how the two of them were different for you and if you found um, did you feel anything in the crowd as to what was going to happen later in Woodstock 99? As we know, we've seen the documentary and whatnot. What was your experiences like? Yeah, the 94 one was really fond memories. I mean, we we were so green. We had just, <clears throat> we, 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 we got signed in May of 94. We immediately, and we'd just been playing clubs, you know, our, our entire career. We, you know, we 
would basically play for our girlfriends or whoever, you know, family, whatever. Um, we went from that to opening for Aerosmith for the summer. And then we did Woodstock. And it just, you know, it was a lot going on in our little green brains. Um, so that was a fun, that, that was a fun experience, the 94. 99, we, it wasn't that much fun to be on. We, we got in and got the hell out. I didn't even we didn't even stay around for all the crazy shit that happened. <laughs> I don't, did, did you guys see the the, the documentary? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I'm curious, like, what was your vantage point to all that? Like, did you see it coming? Yeah, we we were fortunate enough to uh, to to avoid all of that mess. I think we at that point in our career too, we were uh, Ed and I were going through divorces. And it was just like the road, like those many years on the road just takes a toll on your personal life. So we were, we were just kind of in the burnt, burnt out mode or, or just entering into that phase. It took another couple of years before we really burned out and hmm. set out, you know, set a few plays out to, just to collect our, our senses. Considering the amount of fires at Woodstock 99, that's kind of ironic. What's that? I said, considering the amount of fires that were set at Woodstock '99, that's kind of ironic that you were burnt out. <laughs> exactly. Good point. Good point. Yeah. Good point. Good point. Yeah. I was going through your set at at '99, and it actually seemed very peaceful. The sun was shining. Um, the crowd seemed pretty laid back at the time. So I guess you guys were lucky they enough had two to get stages. out there. We did play on the left uh, before uh, the chaos and the Bacal stage. <laughs> and when you guys are starting to tour and you're as you said you're like really green and you're figuring out who collective soul is like wh- how long do you think it would it took you guys to, to be like be confident and say we're a band we're collective soul was there ever a period where you're almost like oh i think i got imposter syndrome i don't know what we're doing up here or did you all have like mm. a mellow kind of we know what we're doing. We're building this. Well, um, I, I think it went in stages for us. Like, cause our, after the second record, we went through uh, the rite of passage of having to sue lawyers, and it was just a mess. Money's in escrow. You know, we sold millions of records, and we have part of basically no money. Um, still living with my parents, uh, so. That confidence was was there, but it was still just like you, know, you you're, it wasn't you weren't king of the world by any stretch. So by the time we finished, or actually started recording Dosage, which is the one with uh, Heavy and Run, uh, we were we were on top of our game. But it took us those first four years to go through all those experiences to get the lawsuits out of the way. And um, and to, to, to make that record, which is probably a, well, the best one, or the, the best is subjective, but it's like it, it was one of the best times, the most collaborative mm. record that, that we made. I mean, maybe these past couple ones have been really great. You know, just a great experience, or you, you know, you're, like going back and recording this last one at the Elvis House, and we all lived together in one house. We haven't done that in years. It was kind of like reconnecting with each other and, you know, so that, that that one was a cool one too. But yeah, to answer your question, I think it probably took us a few years. And once we hit stride there, we've kind of been, been good with it. Been good with it. Over your career, you've pretty much played every size venue possible from amphitheaters to theaters to arenas to to festivals, obviously, and, you know, down to small clubs. Do you have a, a sweet spot? personally that you that you like are you a small club guy are you an arena guy where do you feel best uh i think all things being equal and you know you have your crowd there like a a closed-in arena is my favorite to be honest it's like the energy is like all there and you know it's like some of these outdoor amphitheaters you know they're nice too but i feel like it's the music just, you know, it goes away because it, it lifts off into the into the ether. The, the arena ones are just closed in, and I, I would when I would go to 
shows when I was a kid, and I, I just I loved that feeling. Man. I loved it. My first arena show was U2 Joshua Tree in '87, and I, I it, it was you know changed my life. So it's that either that or like a, like a a theater, like a you know five thousand seat theater, whatever you know, pick your number. But those are always fun too. Um, and interesting enough, like I don't. I don't ever get nervous, really. You get excited about playing. Um, but playing these, playing small shows, like little club shows, I haven't done one in quite a while, but those are the ones that are actually, like, I really get in my head because it's just like they're so much more intimate, you know. Like playing for, you know, 15, 20,000 people or whatever, like that, that never really bothered me. I feel that. I feel that. Now, you guys uh... – the song Perfect Day featured Elton John. I'm just kind of curious. Uh, how did you hear, like, you guys were going to work with Elton? Did you actually get to meet him, or did Elton just, like, yeah. do his track? So, Elton, his uh, he's, a, he's a buddy. He uh, When our first record came out, he, he loved it and called Ed up, and they became friends, and we would go over to his house and hang out. He loves new music, so he was always – we'd go – Meet him at his house. He, he lived in Atlanta at the time where, where we were. And uh, we'd go over to his house and meet up before and even have some new artist that he loves and wanted to share it uh, and, you know, give us the music and we'd go have dinner. And we just came buddies and then ask him, you know, do you want, you know would he be into it? And he was like, yeah, of course. So he just came over one afternoon, Ed had written a song. He listened through it literally once, played through it once, and then tracked it the third time, and it was over. His vocals and the piano. I mean, it was pretty, <laughs> he's pretty good at what he does. It was, uh, it was pretty interesting. Hmm. Now, I live in Georgia, so can you give me Ellen John's address so I can go meet up with him? Um. Yeah, well, he doesn't live, I, you know what? I don't know if he sold his coast, but he's definitely not spending as much time at uh, his place he, he lives in a high-rise in buckhead oh okay yeah just let me yeah. know I'll, I'll stop by it'll be cool yeah, I, I'm, yeah. I'll just drop I'm, your name it's all right man have at it have at it you know your your career has spanned so many decades now um i'm sure you have fans that have followed you all this time but uh, I'm curious, you know, you got this tour going all the way through November um, with the age of streaming and social media. Are you finding um, a new influx of fans or are you finding um, that same core keep coming out to your shows? What's the uh, what's the audience look like these days? Yeah. Yeah, we're at the, we're 30 years in. So it's like we're seeing lots of uh, parents bringing their kids or, you know, that kind of thing, which is, I think, it's great. It's kind of hit that generational age when you're, you know, when somebody was 20, they're listening to us at 25, now they're, you know, whatever math is, and they have, you know, a teenager, you know, and they're coming to the show. So that that part's fun to see. And, you know, like with us playing with Hootie, uh, you know, it's kind of a mixed up crowd in a good way. Like it's people that just like songs, you know, and Darius has done a great job with his, uh, country music career, and then Edwin's solid. So it's a good night of music. Does he ever, does he, does he ever bust out like uh, the country stuff too? Does he blend everything together, um, or is it all Hootie and the Blowfish song? Yeah, yeah, he'll play. Yeah, he plays a few of his country stuff, and yeah, they got a cool set. They do some fun covers, and they do the you know the the massive hits. Now you guys were all tying together for a long time, but I know, like, you have new drummers, you have a new lead guitar. Uh, just mm. out your head, like, how, what was the feeling like, like, switching up the band at points throughout mm. the years? Was it an easy transition, or was there any kind of hiccups along the way, or what What was yeah, there, there Early on, there were the hiccups. Um, just because it was just so... Stupid! What went down is just so. When the first our first guitar player left the band, it was just annoying. Um, and then when it got 
smooth for a little while, and then our, our, our first drummer had some substance abuse issues, so that that didn't work out. So then we ultimately, like 13 years ago, uh, Johnny Johnny Rab, our drummer, and Jesse Triplett, our guitar player, popped on. And we've been solid ever since. Like this is the, the most uh, productive, creative. Like you, you know, they're they're young. You know, anytime you get new energy mixed in, it it you know kind of kicks kick starts everybody so we've had a we've had a good run with those fellas if you were to look back at dean from three decades ago as far as preparation and touring life um and dean in 2024 how how is that guy alike and how is that guy different as far as preparing for music goes a uh, same in a lot of ways like because we've never had any kind of real ritual we just uh, we sit around and um that sounds a little silly, but like I bust each other's chops. Like everybody's just cracking jokes. Somebody gives a, we got a big laugh, you know, and it just kind of breaks the ice. If there's any kind of tensions, any kind of whatever, it's like nobody take yourselves too serious. Let's just go, you know, we're just playing rock and roll. And it's, it's kind of been that way the entire time. Uh, obviously there's, there have been bad nights or there's, you know, we're not playing like an ideal situation or whatever it may be. But, uh, it's really, it's relatively low key and just not taking yourself too serious. Now, as I said, I currently live in Georgia, been here for six years. I know you guys were born and raised here. What is the most mm-hmm. Georgia thing about Dean Rowland and what is the least Georgia thing about Dean Rowland? The most Georgia thing is yeah. I was born downtown Atlanta, the Georgia Baptist Hospital. And um, I grew up and I lived there until I was 25. And then I moved to, to New York City. The least Georgia thing is I live in San Diego, California now for the past 10 years. So, mm. Yeah, that is about as least Georgia as I can get. <laughs> not a lot of boiled peanuts out in San Diego, I bet. <laughs> no, no. Not, not, not too much humidity, not too much Georgia heat, but I... I uh, I get back. My mom, our mom is there and my brothers and we still, the band still is headquartered out of there. It's just been a, a good chunk of time back, back home. Give us a little insight into the writing process of uh, your new music, your albums. Are you guys demoing songs at home? Are you uh, writing live in the studio? What is the band's writing process these days? It's, to be honest, it's all of the above and the <laughs> We really, you never know where it's coming from. Like, you're just looking for a spark, an idea. It's going to come from, like, a lot of times Ed will come in with a very clear idea of what he wants, you know, and it's just, we just kind of, like, follow the leader. And there's other times, like, the spark comes from, um, you know, just a a fun riff that we were jamming at Soundcheck or some drum groove or, or something like that. And um and you just you follow that spark and you serve the song and that's kind of been our mantra through the years and try to avoid being in any one one method because you just you just never know where that that creative spark is going to come from in this day and age uh, i'm just kind of curious do you have a set time where you're like i want to do music until this date and then just like leave it all gone, or are you one of those? It's like I'm go, I want to be ninety, holding my guitar and dying on stage. Yeah, I'll play to the end. I don't see <laughs> there's no sense in stopping, you know, unless there's some physical ailment that I you know, prohibits me. But no, I mean it's, that's the beauty of music. I mean, I, you know, get to do this for a long, long, long time. Hopefully. Yeah, I want to ask you, if you weren't doing music, what would uh, Dean Rowling be doing for a living? I can't ask this question. <laughs> it kind of sucks because I never really had a plan B. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it be, I would have figured something out. Um, but it's just music has always been that thing. And, I, you know, Ed, Ed kind of has the same answer, and so does, so does Will. I mean, it's just I don't know. I mean, I have other interests. Like I, I love 
reading about architecture and and so I don't know maybe, maybe it would be some version of that stuff but I don't know I really don't hmm. well I mean that's a testament to you guys and uh, the band and doing what you love for a living and finding a way to do that uh, before we go, Dean, I want to thank you for coming on and giving us a, a few minutes of your time yet again. We'd love to have you on when Collective Soul is doing something new. Um, where if people want to check out what the band is up to or what Dean Rowland is up to, uh, where's the best place for them to go? Uh, I mean, it, it, we're on all the social media platforms, with collectivesoul.com, um, and we're all in, so whoever has, whatever their preferences are, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, well, you know, et cetera. And my final question to you is, you seem such a laid-back human being. We always enjoy talking to you. I'm just curious, like, 90s, there was a lot of different bands that had beefs and items like that. Did anybody have a collective soul beef? Did, did anybody, you get a vibe, like, from God knows what reason, man, I don't like that collective soul? Oh, yeah, there was always the one that Billy Corgan was always <laughs> making noises like he hated our band and still hates our band. I don't know. I, I've never even met him. Uh, but I was like, yeah, like, that, he, like the second like, you said it, it's like you know what that does make sense. Unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. So, I, but I kept hearing just these things. Like we were, tra- it was early on. We were trailing one of the uh, Lollapaloozas that they were on, and, and like we would be in the city like two days after or whatever, and some. Other fans that had gone to Lollapalooza would come to ours, and you know, after the shows, we would hang out with people and just chat, and whatever. And he was, they were saying, and we've heard it like multiple times that he would be on stage saying, uh, he would start playing Shine, and he, and he would say, This band stole, stole this song from me, or some, some version of that. And he goes, I fucking hate this band, you know, whatever. I'm like, All right, dude, I don't know exactly what you're talking about, but you're, uh, Getting a little aggressive on the unnecessary hate, but <laughs> that's okay. Yeah, he's a weird guy. I mean, he owns a wrestling company, so none of so all of this makes sense. I think that <laughs> I think part of it is that like he he's into that wrestling world and he's he's looking for a you know a nemesis or some or you know what I mean. Cutting a hot promo against Black and Soul. Yeah, never <laughs> <laughs> really did. <laughs> Dean, thanks again for your time, man, and uh, keep doing what you're doing. It seems like you guys are still on the right track and, and still making new fans, so thanks again. All right. Thank you. Thank you, guys, for your time. Dean Rowland, Mike. Now, one, Dean is a, a really nice guy, really awesome guy. Yeah. Um, two, it's awesome to see Collective Soul still doing it. Three, mm-hmm. if people tune into our last episode – Yes, that was the guess that I, um, you called my phone number from my wife's number. Yeah. Uh, um, I was getting frustrated, kept hanging up on my quote unquote wife, uh, who turned out to be you. Then, yes, a number from Georgia, who I'm like, okay, here's Mike on the conference line that we set up. Uh, it's going to be Dean. Uh, I mean, it's going to be Mike. And I answered the phone going, hey, baby. And he goes, hello. I'm like, Mike? He's like, no, uh, this is Dean. I'm like, oh, Dean, sorry. Like, uh, Dean, on verbal shenanigans, all our guests are our babies. So that's how we always roll when we come online. Yeah. And then um, I still hadn't had you on the line yet because I kept ignoring you from my wife's phone number. So I had to tell mm-hmm. Dean Rowland of Collective Soul, this little band, Collective Soul, hold on mm-hmm. a second. I have to get my co-host on the line and then my wife is calling and i have no clue what's going on mm. and then eventually i figured out too and you're like yeah i'm like how are you on my wife's phone number mm. then i had to merge the two of them making a nice five to eight minutes of very awkward uh moments for me so i hope you're happy thank you dean for being a good interview i'm glad that michael's shenanigans if you will did not scare you off as i answered the phone yeah, we should name this episode Michael's Shenanigans. I got to be honest with you. I, I think that it's going to tumbleweed us back to the top, if you will, with that kind of name. Yeah, tumbleweed us back to the top. That is yeah. quite a... Uh, I mean, yeah, that works. Sure. <laughs> and on a side note, um, 
you talked about editing uh, before the interview. You had to do some editing in the interview. You're not supposed to tell them that. That's the top secret. But what? <laughs> yes, I recorded. Um, my audio was so terrible because I used AirPods that day, and there must have been something in the maybe in the mic or something, some dirt or or, or whatnot. So yes, I went in neuronically and re-edited all my questions. So. Um, I didn't change any of the questions. I literally had to cut them out, ask them again. So if it sounds a little interesting, like I'm just kind of popping in with this wonderfully clear audio, that's why. And hopefully it sounds better than Mike's because he's a jerk off. I mean, I am, but that was still rude of you. I mean, come on. Now. <laughs> but I, I'm neurotic. Like if it sounds terrible, I like have to figure out a way to make it sound better. But And that's why, Mike, we are the 126th uh, uh, charting comedy interview podcast in India, just to let you know. Yeah. Indians love us. What can I tell you, man? I mean, one, 126. <laughs> However, according to Chartable, we dropped 13 spots in yeah. India. I mean, my marketing in Bangladesh didn't really work out too well. So we concentrated on India and, you know, the all around Hyderabad, they've been just chanting our names all day and night, you know, but. We'll get that 13 spots back and maybe go up 14, you know, kind of so, prove to the Indian people what we're we are. We're going to get Mike tweeting again, hey, India, and, and, and see what kind of kind of results <laughs> we get. So, uh, Mike, what do you got? Uh, Scott, um, have you heard about this uh, documentary, uh, Chimp Crazy? I did hear about it, and I... The other day, I meant to go watch it, and you know something happened where I got distracted and did not get a chance to. But I am intrigued. Yeah, um, I haven't watched it yet, but and I'm not a hundred percent sure if I told this story on the cast before. But do you know I somewhat have a weird little connection or kind of parallel to Chimp Crazy, if you will. If you waited 485 episodes to tell us that you had some kind of love relationship with the chimpanzee, no. um, I'm going to be really upset because that would have been really good for like episode two where you're first <laughs> growing your audience. Um, but uh, no, I don't think you ever told me why you would be related to a chimp. Well, I'm not related to the chimp, but I have a story yeah, so let's not, that is somewhat in the direction of chimp. Crisis. You're right. Let's not insult the chimpanzee. Okay, so... <laughs> For those who don't know, Chimp Crazy is a new documentary. It was, it's made by the same guy who did Tiger King. And it follows around this woman, Tanya Haddix, who loves chimps and spends all her time with them. And she's the head of a uh, foundation. Uh, the show features the Missouri Primate Foundation. Now, that was started by uh, Connie Braun Casey, Scott. Um, she started. She actually started a business called Chim Party. Where she had a business okay. where she rented out baby chimps for birthday parties, nursing homes, and TV and film productions. Now, this, is, this, is this company still in business? Uh, as best I could tell, it may be. Oh, awesome, because somebody's got a birthday coming up, and Ooh. don't get mad when a little chimp shows up at your door. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So, so like I said, so this Connie Casey used to own it, and then in 92, one of the chimps she owned bit off her husband's nose. So she didn't want bad publicity going out there about chimp party. So what she did, she started a nonprofit called the Missouri Primate Foundation. Oh, so okay. she was running Chim Party, and she's running this foundation. And this foundation is supposed to take in, like, bad monkeys or whatever that are retired from TV and stuff like that to keep them safe, even though she has a side business where she's renting out good shit. <laughs> bad, bad monkeys who retired from TV. Yeah. yeah, the bad ones. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. I gotta say, I like the name Chimp Party, though. Kind of a cool. Yeah, name. that 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 got a good ring, regardless. Oh. But, so, oh. as I said, they took in chimpanzees, and um, in 2001, a 28 year old chimp named Susie escaped her household and was shot and killed by a 70 year old who lived next door to her, which caused a lot of controversy mm -hmm. right there. Now that chimp Susie. 
uh, before she died, she gave birth to six chimps, including one named Travis. Okay. Can we stop there? Sure. One second. Why does everyone who names a chimp give it like really normal people names like Travis, Susie? Like, why aren't they, why don't they have like pet names? Like here's Rocket or here's Cookie or here's Fido. Like, why are we naming chimps? With, why? Because they're close to people. They get people names. I guess they figure with the whole evolution thing. Like if they if like the next chimp evolves into a human, they do me all here. Here's the world's smartest chimpanzee, Bobo. Like they wanted to actually like make lectures uh, and so forth. So if you had a chimp, what are you naming it? Um, Samson. Sam. That's not a bad. That's not a bad chimp name. I Thank like you. it. I like it. Okay. All right. So I introduce Travis into this equation of the story, Scott. Now, uh-huh. you have any idea what Travis might be famous for? Don't give out the answer, but do you think you know the answer? What Travis did? Honestly, no. I don't think I do. <laughs> So Travis was owned by uh, a woman named Sandra Harold who lived in Connecticut. And uh, mm. Travis is known as the chimp that uh, gotcha. attacked a woman named Charla Nash, mm. inflicting injuries to her face and limbs, which led to a face transplant. The monkey. I remember this. Yes. Her face. And the basic story for those who don't know, uh, she basically. Uh, the owner, Sandra, she left her house and the chimp came outside and Charla was living with her. And while she was trying to get the monkey Travis back into the house, she was holding a Tickle Me Elmo uh, doll, which apparently was the chimp's favorite toy. And in a rage, he attacked her and started eating her face. And uh, it led to her... <clears throat> Uh, Sandra, the owner, having to attack her chimpanzee with a butcher knife, try to get it off her friend's face. Uh, the cops came around. The chimp actually tried to get into the cop car to attack the <laughs> cops, and the cops shot the monkey, killing it dead. The chimpanzee. Like, what? What could go wrong with owning an animal that is five times stronger than us? That could swing from things. That can crush you with its arms that can bite you to rip its face off um yeah. and is probably iq level smarter than like a third of america what yeah. can go wrong and that's wonderful for birthday parties nursing homes and wonderful and film productions right if they're not then they go in the foundation don't get them confused <laughs> chimp party good foundation bad bad chimps all right so now that i've set up what the tv show is about uh, let's circle back to that date in 2009. Mm-hmm. I am still living in New Jersey. I'm working in an office in Morristown and I'm driving in and I would say this is 2009. So I'm probably hearing this news about somebody getting their face eaten off by a pet chimp on like O and A or something like that going into work. So naturally when you go into work and you hear stuff like that, water cooler talk, you're talking with people, you're probably cracking jokes, uh-huh. right? Yep. Right? So I'm in the office. We're having conversations. I know I'm probably n- nothing like stellar where I can remember the joke or anything, but I'm, I'm kidding around with stuff like that and all. Maybe like, hey, can you watch my pet chimpanzee for the night or something like that? Right. So... <clears throat> As I go through the day and we're chat chatting with other people and maybe I made a little joke or whatever, somebody goes, you know, the person who got eaten worked for this company, right? I think I vaguely remember you telling yeah. me this. <laughs> and, and I'm looking, I'm like, ha, 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 whatever. They're like, um, no, this girl worked for the help desk. Mm-hmm. I don't know for how long. Um, I will preface by saying that office, we probably had, I would say a good hundred something, maybe 150 desks, multiple shifts. So, so we we're talking about 450, pe- 500 people. Yeah. I didn't of- know this Charla lady, but apparently. Well, 500 people. There's at least four people that are into chimps. Yeah. 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 But. I, I'm like, yeah, whatever. And 
maybe an hour after that, company email goes out from the president of the company, basically saying how tragic it was that our former employee got her face eaten off by a chimp <laughs> from the boss. Yeah. <laughs> Which kind of adds to the level of, oh, I'm starting to feel bad. Uh, one of the people in our IT group worked for the help desk that was she was under, and apparently he managed her, and I may have I kind of went over to him like, Ugh, I, I didn't know. And he, he was cool about it. He's like, yeah, yeah, I was holding my tongue. But uh, like, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't want to like yeah. put a monkey wrench in your day. I mean, uh, I know, uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> what's the matter? Why, why are you rubbing uh, your neck? You got a chimp in your neck? I mean, crank in your uh, neck. You know? <laughs> uh, I feel like a big, fat, stupid ape. I mean, I mean, I mean. <laughs> Idiot. All right, let's get back to work. No more monkey business. Shit. Oh, you know? <laughs> oh I did it again. <laughs> so, yeah, Scott, that is kind of my association with Chimp Crazy. I'm possibly made bad jokes with some people who actually knew her. Now I'm hoping there's like uh, part of the documentary with like someone's face blacked out. And they're like, you know, that day was crazy at work. But it's unbelievable how some people have no manners. And uh, there's this one guy, he was making chimp jokes all day. Um, and he made us call him the Burls all day. I don't know who he was, but he was an <laughs> asshole. <laughs> I was holding back the tears, and then I had to hold back the anger because some idiot all thought he made a banana peel joke on her. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, I have not seen the documentary. I will <clears throat> I will check it out. I'm sure. It, well, just now story. I got to see if I'm in it. <laughs> the story alone has to be just interesting enough to watch. It's not like I'm watching any uh, amazing television in it right now anyway. So, Yeah, uh, the, apparently they, they shot it. They convinced her, the, the person who's running it now, they convinced her, oh, we're, we're the good people. We want to show how great it is. When in turn, they were doing everything to see all the bad shit, crazy stuff. With the foundation and all, not chimp party though. Chimp yeah. party is rocking and rolling, and good those chimps. are some good monkeys coming to your household for your birthday. Okay, you got me. <laughs> yes. Well, we, we speaking of that us us good monkeys here. Hope to hope you enjoyed the uh, the banter, if you will, tonight and our our, our guest Dean. But uh, Berlo, I think it's time to get on out of here, and we'll be back next week. So. Um, anything Possibly. to promote? Um, yeah, we'll see. Anything to promote before we uh, get on out of here? Yeah, Scott, I am pro promoting a new artist who will be releasing her music on all streaming platforms soon. Uh, that performer's name is Izzy Burlu. That's right. Any relation? Um, yeah, she kind of sleeps in the same bed with me. So, uh, that's one of your dogs? No, 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 no. Callie is not having an album. Scott is my lovely wife. Not yet. And, uh, him. No, she's my wife. No, the Cali album. Oh, yeah, yeah. Cali, <laughs> you, you gonna make an album for the eighty? You, you cool girl. Okay. In any case, um, my lovely wife Izzy is putting out an album as Callie's now kissing me as we talk to her, and we're providing one of her first songs called "Hello Codependency" that we're going to put at the end of this episode. She made sure. I shouted out the people who was helping her on this project. Warren Nichols is on keyboard with the Warren Nichols Enterprise. Donnie Hammond, producer of the... Daryl Hammond. Wow. No, no, Donnie Hammond. Oh, of The After Dark Recording Studio in Cartersville, Georgia. And bass guitar and Kramer Smith on drums. So, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed as we uh, go off the air. I know you're always happy when we're off the air, but enjoy my wife's music and then celebrate us. Stop talking. Yeah, and funny fact, uh, Hello Codependency original working title was My Chimp Husband is a Big Buffoon. Um, but it seemed that it didn't have the same... Didn't, didn't fit on the album didn't, cover. Didn't, I gotta roll, be honest. It didn't roll off, off the tongue as well. And I will promote a, also in the art world, um, October 10th, it is the return of the Verbal Shenanigans Comedy Show to Tap House 15 in uh, Jefferson, New Jersey. Aaron Berg, headliner, national headliner all over the place. Uh, he is hilarious. If you are easily offended, I don't recommend coming to this particular one. Uh, but it is 
$69 for a three course meal and a no, $59 for a three course meal and a wonderful night out. Uh, see, Callie's trying to get on, um, on the That's Leia, but oh, go on. Whatever. One of your 18 dogs. Um, uh, so come on out. Uh, there are still tickets left. It is me, Peter Ravello, Ryan Patrick, and Aaron Berg. So, uh, once again, I want to thank Dean Roland for coming on the show. Uh, go check out Collective Soul, their new album. They're touring through um, November, so they got a lot of dates out there with Hootie. Um, and that's it, guys. Uh, we'll be back. Uh, life is funny. Laugh at it. Keep the wind at your back. And don't be a monkey's uncle. <laughs>
strong enough to take it. Ignore my own. I know how to fake it. I'm so addicted to this misery. My purpose in life is to be me.